Thank you. Well, Kate is staying on stage because we're going to go into a discussion session, first of all, which is titled Creating Our Future and Owning Our Place in It. Now, to talk about change, of course, is a bit of a cliche, but you do live uh, in extraordinarily changing times, not just in terms of your sector uh, and the way it's being viewed by politics and government, as, as we saw yesterday, but the, the social frameworks uh, that people are living in, family structures, aging population. So how do you deal with all of that? How do you harness the benefits of the future? Can I ask our other panelists to step up? You've got a, you've got a stellar panel of thinkers uh, coming on the stage now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Nick Walkley is chief executive of Homes England. He's got that, uh, that two billion quid from Theresa May, um, which I think <laughs> makes him literally her handbag carrier. Um, <laughs> Nick, Nick, um, Nick has an a, a, a illustrious background, as many of you will know, in local government, having been chief executive at two big London boroughs, um, and is taking his place next to, uh, next to Kate. Matthew Taylor um, is next to Nick. Uh, Matthew is chief executive of the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, he's been previously general secretary and chief executive of the IPPR think tank, um, and he was... He's had various positions um, in, uh, in, 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 the, in government and Labour Party, um, lastly chief advisor on political strategy to Tony Blair, but he also ran the uh, uh, policy unit as well. Anne Power is Professor of Social Policy at the London School of Economics. She's been involved in European and American housing and urban problems since 1965, um, and she is head of um, LSE Housing and Communities, which is a research group based within the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion. And finally on the end, uh, Philip Blond is director of ResPublica. He's a very well-known political thinker and commentator, bridging the gap between politics and practice. So you have, a, you have an amazing panel of people, um, hopefully with some great answers to your questions. This is very unstructured in, in that I want to do as little as possible in this section, because it's my first one, so I'd like to break myself in easily. So, so, so this is all about questions from you. Um, so please do have a think. Use the app, and I will pick them up. But to, to get the, 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 the cogs whirring, if you like, we have a little video. Let's have a look at that first. Today, across the world, we're facing unprecedented amounts of change, disruption, uncertainty. Online communities should unite us and not divide us. You almost don't know where to start to unpick it. 93,000 kids, homeless. What a disgrace. This current situation can't continue. Something has to change. You're just not your own person, you're just a number. And against that backdrop, we launched our Futures programme, Creating Our Future. Day in, day out, for 150 years, housing associations have been improving people's lives. We are the biggest and most successful group of social businesses, of social enterprises in this country and in this country's history. By bringing together housing associations from the whole sector, that's where we're going to make real change. Because the truth is, the ideas that have truly changed the world, whether it's the car or the internet, have been collective endeavours. It's time for us to come together across the country to change the world. We spent six months speaking to hundreds of people across the housing association sector. Everybody that would talk to us, chief executives, residents, and we spoke to people that work at housing associations. And what they said is that we could do even more to deliver on our social purpose to improve people's lives by thinking differently about our homes, our services, and our role within communities. The next thing we did was run Ideas Labs across the country. Our idea was to bring together as many people from as many housing associations as we possibly could to all come up with ideas. 300 people from more than 150 different housing associations participated. There were some real golden nuggets in there, so we put on a three-day hackathon that we called Future Hack. We're here in Millbank Tower in London for day one of Future Hack. We We're are so, so excited. excited. It's all about to start. People are travelling from all over the country to get here. We brought together 50 innovators from across our sector who selected the best of the ideas that we'd come up with as a sector and worked them up into initial prototypes. The room is buzzing. 
I'm feeling really energised about the entire process. It was so exciting to see real people working on these real ideas. Who wouldn't be inspired? All this has been leading to the most ambitious part of this programme. The Greenhouse. Where 26 innovators from housing associations from every part of the country who work full time for 16 weeks together to create a product or a service or a new approach that helps tackle the different social challenges that we as a sector collectively identify. There they're working to develop those ideas further and make them real. No one has ever tried social innovation on a sector-wide level before. We believe in what we're doing. We're all pulling in the same direction. We've got the support of an entire sector behind us. There is so much drive to actually make a difference and do something different. There is a huge, huge potential to do something game-changing with this. Being part of this team that's going to change people's lives. That's why I got into housing. Let me just try and grab some opening thoughts from each of our panellists on what they think are the big things that you as a sector need to be thinking about in terms of uh, innovation to sort of to respond to the changes that are going on in society and our, the challenges of, 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 of the way we live and, and the opportunities offered by new technology. Philip Blond, why don't you kick us off? Yes, um, thank you and, and wonderful to be here. Um, I think we need to take a serious reality check on the values that I suspect we all share. Um, I've been some 10 years now in, in public policy, and I remember advocating very strongly for social businesses, for transformation, remember the big society, etc. And some 10 years on, and my first paper was on, I ever wrote was on mutualization. Um, I've written many papers on housing, we have to accept that social businesses have not gone to scale. They do incredibly important work in the relatively niche areas that they do. Just like mutualism in the UK hasn't gone to scale. Nothing we really value has become decisive or reached a tipping point. And I think that's a tragedy. It's a social tragedy, it's an economic tragedy. And the state <coughs> still retains the decisive tipping point, as does the market. So what can a sector that arguably, and here I completely agree, that is arguably the biggest, the most decisive sector do to actually make a difference that they've always wanted to make, but arguably we've always been less than the sum of our parts? And we at ResPublica argued, we got very close to the chance for adopting it. I was in the Treasury um, and arguing alongside Sajid Javid for what we called, you may recall, the National Housing Fund. I argued the new place for social housing, for, for um, housing associations, was to become guaranteed buyers. That's what the housing sector needs for supply, guaranteed buyers, where we enter the market because the problem with the British housing market, which nobody really uh, grasps, is speed and scale. We essentially build for a very small section of the market that can afford to buy at the rates. If, we, if you came together as a sector, and look what the Prime Minister now recognises how decisive you are, and you're doing sector-wide innovation, which, thank goodness, is needed. So you're, you're creating the space for those big questions. But you have to become the new dominant non-private sector uh, <coughs> deliverers of housing supply. And that, yes, you can be developers yourself, but you need to become guaranteed buyers at scale. And we analyzed this, and we argued originally for a 10 billion per yearly fund, but it also works on a local basis. And essentially, over a decade, due to how the, the housing values and the long rates of tenure that housing associations get, in any part, you gain about 30% of value. Now, imagine if we did that at scale. Every type of guaranteed purchase where you buy and then you rent, 
you could redistribute that 30% at scale in any way you want. You could give it back to people so they become owners. You could create skills. You could create local schools. You could take over local schools. Operating at scale to do what, to do what you should do by delivering at scale, then perhaps you can be the social tipping point that we have manifestly failed to deliver. And I think that's the scale, that's the ambition in a vacuum of supply where everyone only has partial answers, you need to step forward with the whole answer. And that's what I, that would be my ask of the sector, to be perfectly honest. And there are many others, but that's where I'll, hopefully that's an innovative ask. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, Anne Power, how do the people in this room own their future? I'd like to take a very different tack. Social landlords have been fighting for the last 150 years to house people in need and help provide homes in communities. They have been successful in lots of ways. They have grown beyond belief. Local authority, council housing, as many of us who remember it know too well, became far too big. Estates were built too big. Too many numbers were produced. There was a surplus. The government in the 1970s had a crisis of what it calls difficult to let housing. We mustn't forget that history. Housing associations came into their own precisely because they were community-based, <coughs> community-oriented, rescued old housing, saved tenants that were insecure into more secure housing, and all of those things. So, in fact, the housing association sector in partnership with local authorities. Let's be fair, local authorities went with that agenda, they bought into it, and they really helped. And I think that is something that we need to remember today, that that partnership can actually do a huge amount to do what it needs to do. The big thing is that to provide housing at low cost, of quality, that's secure for people on low incomes in precarious jobs, which is the big problem, uh, not building more houses, but actually having people in decent, secure, stable work. Um, who closes that gap? And that's where I think it's really difficult because housing ought to provide us. Sorry, I put one of those mints in my mouth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> housing providers have been forced to push their own value, make money in the market in order to precisely to extend their social value. And by doing that, they've become bigger, they've become more remote, they've relied more on technology, and they've hoped that the existing stock would float along. I don't know if David Montague is here, but he wrote a very famous article, famous for me, in Inside Housing after the Grenfell disaster, saying how terrible he felt when he looked at how development-driven bigness had made him forget the front line. I think that was probably an exaggeration, and I'm probably misquoting David slightly. But the fact is, we must remember the front line. The reason why Theresa May, I believe, came out the way she did yesterday with the backing of her Secretary of State is because of the lessons from Grenfell. That was a tragedy. But much worse than that, it exposed everything that we'd forgotten about, which was on the ground, front line, meeting the people who actually live there and actually have the experience of what's going on not only meeting their needs, but actually listening to what they know and don't know. They've usually been there for longer than the housing staff. And so I think we have to relearn those lessons, strengthen what we do. And I have to say, from my experience, by working in something we set up called the Housing Plus Academy, I have uncovered, not me personally, you all have uncovered, literally thousands of amazing experiments and amazing acts of helping and building strength in communities. And you just have to build on that. I actually personally believe that by having millions and millions of these little tiny initiatives all over the place, backed by a framework which Theresa May says she wants to put in place, can actually have a transforming effect. And I'm just so impressed by what you do and just keep pushing. Thank you. Um, Matthew. Yeah, I'm going to be incredibly brief, otherwise we won't get any questions yeah. anymore. But... Um, uh, so I you know, completely agree with what Philip and what Anne have said, and you know, the Prime Minister gave you a challenge yesterday in what I thought was a, you know, a pretty brilliant speech, to be honest. Um, so yeah, more ambition about building houses for 
uh, affordable houses, building houses for social rent. Now that's really important. Uh, changing people's lives, the other half of what you do, whether that's through employment or social care or building community capacity in a whole variety of ways. And that's very important as well. So the one thing I would say, the, one, the only new point I'd make, is that I think you're also in the business of creating an alternative reality. Because I think that things aren't as bad in this country as they are in many other places, but they, there's no reason to believe they couldn't get worse in terms of polarization, in terms of disenchantment, uh, um, in terms of a profound sense of a loss of agency. And you know, if you look at objectively at where we are in terms of people's attitudes, there is more reason to be pessimistic than optimistic about the future. And so what we need to do is to give people who feel in a sense that they are victims of systems that don't work, or systems that are so big and powerful that there is nothing that can be done in the face of them. We need to give people a sense that actually things can work, that things can be done, um, that a difference can be made. And I think that's particularly necessary at the level of place. I think that it is very hard at the moment to see how we can convince people the nation state can work. And I believe one day we can create a set of institutions differently, do things differently, we can. But they are willing to believe that their place can work, their city can work. And so the one extra thing I would say is be, as much as you can, civic actors. Be part of the discussion that is taking place all around Britain, around how cities, towns can be different, can be more in, have, uh, have inclusive economies, <laughs> have a strong sense of civic purpose. So I think all the stuff you've heard, but you are also the creators and purveyors of an alternative reality where things do get done, where people do have agency, where people are listened to, where people are in control of their own destiny. And that's a very important responsibility right now. Thank you. And I think that also answers the most popular question on the list so far, which was um, Matthew Taylor's colleague, Atif Shafiq, was dismissive of the social housing green paper. Are Matthew and the panel more positive about the PM's speech? I think pretty brilliant is more positive. Um, yeah, we have a eclectic <laughs> views within the RSA. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Nick. Um, so uh, uh, if it was a brilliant speech, uh, uh, I couldn't possibly comment as a public official. Uh, what was certain was it was a moment. And actually, I'd like to posit a slightly different view about the future for the sector. Uh, because we move now, don't we, from a time where the sector's felt under the cosh, <coughs> under threat. It's been pretty easy to determine what the agenda of a conference is going to be because you know what you don't like. At that moment where there is consensus that this is a positive group of people who can make a significant contribution, I think the future becomes much more challenging. And I think in three ways to begin with. Firstly, uh, if we are really serious about the future, we probably need to accept the answers aren't in this room. So how do we remove the barriers to entry? How do we make it easier for the next generation of housing associations to start? Are we prepared for the disruption of the people doing it differently, doing it in ways that are uncomfortable, doing it in ways that don't conform to the way that everybody in this room uh, came to be here? And are we prepared to accept that as part of creating a better housing future? Because it seems to me without that disruption, it's very likely we'll simply create a slightly better version of where we are now. The problem is much more profound than that. Uh, secondly, uh, I thought Kate spoke fantastically well about uh, some of the opportunities, but we cast them uh, perhaps too lightly. Uh, we are about, if we're going to get to 300,000, to build the first uh, new towns in a generation. Uh, and I've started to call it the shock of the new. <laughs> so what does a new new town need? Are we really clear what the communities uh, and the places over the next 25 years are going to need to be successful? Where are those ideas and are we prepared for the tremendous challenges that will come with delivering that and the different partnerships that will come with trying to make that happen? It is a scale 
of opportunity, but a scale of challenge collectively we've not faced. And then thirdly, we're going to do all of that whilst our population ages quickly and we shift the demographic as a result of the entire country. So are we ready to somehow be new and ageing at scale at the same time? Thank you very much. Kate. On owning our future, if you want to see innovation in the sector, I really urge you to, to check out the Futures Expo and the work the Greenhouse is doing. You got a little snippet of that uh, in, in the film clip. What has impressed me most about the Greenhouse programme is not necessarily the ideas, it's the collaboration and the engagement the teams have had. I've been interviewed uh, by one of the teams in my current role. They've been out, they've interviewed hundreds of people. And it's the relationships beyond the sector and the collaborations that that can create that will really help make the change. I think the, the announcements we um, heard yesterday from the Prime Minister are fantastic in terms of giving us a foundation to be strong about our role in the future. But let's be clear, there is no political party that is going to save us. If we want the Hollywood ending, if we want to solve the housing <coughs> crisis, if we want everyone to have access to a good quality home that they can afford, we have to own the script. We have to write the script. We have to be the activists, and we have to be willing to do things differently. And I think there is so much potential, and I think we can get that Hollywood ending, but we're going to have to work really hard, we're going to have to work together, and we're going to have to work with a whole multitude of different partners. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the questions are coming in. Let's try and plough through them, and, and, and let's try and uh, have reasonably concise answers, uh, panelists. Um, <laughs> then we can get through as many as, as we can. Um, um, the, the top one at the moment is the disconnect between welfare and housing policies remains, and if anything is growing. Our protests about this have not been heard. What should we do next? And power. I think the disconnect between welfare and housing policy is ghastly, catastrophic. So in the think tanks that we arrange through the Housing Plus Academy, where we bring together tenants to talk about exactly that, or we bring together landlords with governments to talk about it, everybody is stuck on the present course. There are lots of things that people can and do do within their communities to help. I mean, people are incredibly resourceful and obviously I haven't got time to list all the small things that people do to help each other, but for example, communal meal provision so that you don't have the stigma of going to a food bank, I and mean, that's just one tiny example. Actually growing food on scrap land in your estate so that people actually get out, the older generation meets the younger and so on. But none of this really cracks the austerity pinch on people at the bottom. And I think that is where social landlords can do a huge amount more. A lot of the big social landlords that I've talked to say they're going back to the front line, exactly what I was arguing for. So it looks as though big is pushing them in the wrong direction, and some of the biggest, Riverside, Clarion, Home, um, and many others, have, have re realised that they've got to go back and actually help. And people help is what people stuck with welfare reform most often need. So a lot of our debt work, for example, shows that if you give people face-to-face -face help, they can actually overcome a huge number of what seem like insuperable barriers to breaking the logjam that welfare reform is creating. So I'd say really strongly frontline matters and supporting tenant action matters and getting the staff who actually all go into housing because they have a social purpose and social commitment out there doing it. Uh, Matthew, I mean, having worked in policy and political strategy, I mean, given how housing has become this sort of political holy grail, is there something bigger? Is there, is, is there a bigger lever that this organisation can pull to try and affect this particular problem? Yeah, I think there are two elements to this, and uh, I think for lots of social actors, you have to work in these two different ways. On the one hand, you have got to be brave in terms of being advocates for change. And actually, the National Housing Federation has been very effective. And when I talked about the Prime Minister's speech being brilliant, what I meant by that was 
if I was sitting where you were sitting, to have a prime minister, no prime minister has ever spoken at this conference before, come and make that speech to you is a remarkable victory, and it's a fitting end to David's time uh, running the organisation. That that I mean, what a high point to go out on. That doesn't mean that I think the government is great and that the government's policies are working. Um, <laughs> So I think the interesting question is the National Housing Federation should have at least every year one thing that it's arguing for that's nothing to do with its own self-interest, which it is saying this is on behalf of our tenants and this is the thing that we're going to join up with other organisations and we don't care if it antagonises some of our friends in government. We have a responsibility not just to fight for what's in our interest but to fight for the interests of our tenants and welfare. You know, the, the need in the next spending review to understand the way in which welfare cuts are impacting on people could be that, that cause. And then secondly, as Anne said, you also have to be in the business of mitigating the worst effects of these um, policies on your communities and also experimenting, seeing how things can be done differently, enabling people to have better lives on, lo on low incomes. Uh, and by the way, I think that we just don't give enough emphasis to that question. Um, Whatever happens for the next 30 years, there'll be a lot of people on low incomes. There'll be a lot of people in low-skilled, low-paid jobs. That's not going to change. And politicians love to talk about how we're going to upskill people and how we're going to regenerate. But the poor will be with us. And so the question of how it is you enable poor people to have decent lives is an incredibly important question, and not one that we talk about, because in a way it sounds almost defeatist. Politicians want to say, there will be no, elect me and there will be no poor people. Well, that's a false mandate. So this question of how it is you make life, the quality of life better, that people have a sense of decency and respect, even if they are on low incomes, is one that you live with and we need to talk about more as a legitimate public policy uh, question. And just in terms of experimentation, uh, I was at, last week in Rochdale, we're developing a program with Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, which is seeking to combine a basic income experiment, which gives people a year where they're taken out of the terrible stresses and uncertainties that go with kind of welfare conditionality and withdrawal. So for a year, they just have that space of knowing that they've got an income, even whatever else is going on in their lives, with coaching and support to enable people not just to get jobs, but to progress into jobs, because the issue in Rochdale is about a lot of people doing casual, low-paid work, uh, plus the creation of a kind of space where people can come together. And, you know, I think that's a really exciting scheme. We need to see more, alter more uh, as I said earlier, my first answer, more of these kind of alternative realities, yeah. experiments in different ways of living. Nick. Um, so uh, uh, I always enjoy coming to this conference because either uh, Brexit or welfare comes up and I can feel my career dissing, dis disappearing in front of me. <laughs> um, uh, I, I offer two things. The first is... Uh, all my experience in public service tells me never give politicians a binary choice because they'll stick with what they're doing at the moment. And I agree wholeheartedly with Matthew's plea for further experimentation, uh, further alternative realities, just to explore uh, what might be possible. Uh, but secondly, it just strikes me that uh, the Prime Minister's speech yesterday <coughs> was part of a journey that all politics is going on in reconsidering the role of housing. And as a result, there are strange new coalitions emerging that I'd really, really advocate uh, 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 the, the sector work through. So isn't it interesting that in the space of 24 hours we had both London First, the business bod body group, and PwC saying, housing is now a barrier to us growing our own businesses because certain groups no longer want to come and work here. Uh, so there is something about what is the new coalition that's emerging about pretty fundamental issues about our economy that may help you tackle other issues at the same time. Kate, would you take Matthew's idea up? Of well, uh, yeah, an ab issue? absolutely. I think, I think the idea of, um, uh, of campaigning on issues that matter not only to our members as social businesses, but matter to our tenants, to your tenants, to the residents and the communities that they serve is, is really fundamental to the mission of the organisation. And that, that, that opportunity to work in partnership with other voices is really powerful. I mean, having run a, a planning organisation for the last eight years, you know, you get very little traction with government quite often if you want to go in and talk about planning reform. But if you say, 
Actually, we've got, we've got 10 organizations with us. We've got 50 organizations with us. They might range from organizations like Shelter to, to HUK to some of the professional bodies. You have a completely different conversation because it's about the outcomes you want to achieve, yeah. not the process, not the mechanism. It's about getting people into work. It's about people being able to stay in school because they've got a, you know, a stable home life. It's about ensuring people's health better because they have enough to eat and they're not so stressed about being able to pay for their heating. And it's coming at it from different angles with different partners can get a really different result. So I think working in collaboration is, is really fundamental. Philip. Yeah, um, if I look back on 10 years of uh, work in social policy and We've been quite effective. Some of the biggest ideas in British politics have come from us, uh, such as devolution, Manchester. Even today, we had the Labour Party endorsing our ideas on stopping um, uh, forms of gambling, uh, pernicious advertising. But I think the single most important social policy that works is mixing the fates of working class people and middle class people. I think that outcompetes every other single idea. And if you look at the so-called London schools effect, nobody has been able to locate the source of the improvement in working class scores in any single uh, schools policy. Whereas if you track it with housing prices and the fact that the middle classes have been forced back into the state sector and that you mix middle class and working class families that gives you correlation. So what I fear is, is if you become, uh, and I'm all in favor of campaigning organizations, I'm all in favor of advocacy, but if you allow yourself to be pushed into advocating for one relatively small part of the population against everyone else, you're just another partial voice. The real claim and the real gain should be speaking to the phenomenon of insecurity which have cuts across almost all classes. If you actually track the rise of populism across uh, the West, it's all to do with not just economic insecurity, but cultural insecurity. And actually, where people do the evidence, it's cultural insecurity that is a bigger driver. So what you have to do, I think, in order to be the major player you want to be, rather than a sectional voice that is always acted upon, rather than acting, is blend kind of middle class concerns and working class concerns together so that, at, that, so that you are speaking to a wider polity than perhaps you have hitherto for. And given the struggles that people without equity but on relatively high wages face um, uh, in the southeast, for instance, or young people in relatively good career paths, that's an opportunity and an open goal for you. And if you can step through that and become the dominant player, the dominant social, socially conscious player in a broken housing market that currently only serves those who can afford to play in it, then you can be decisive. But if you don't become a dominant player, everything about the modern economy tells us you will just be paying second fiddle for people who play third or fourth fiddle. So I think we're in a situation where we have to crowd out bad behavior. And if you act at scale, and that's why I'm really excited by, by your remarks as the, as, the, as the new chief executive for playing at scale, you can offer solutions to the government that actually national policy has really failed to deliver on. And particularly with devolution, particularly in partnership with the new, um, what I hope will be a new range of unitary councils with the combined authorities, housing uh, associations at scale are clearly part of the answer for mental health, for capturing the wider determinants of health, for education, for reskilling. But what you have to do, I think, is do what um, certain free schools or uh, charter schools did in the United States. They moved up the supply chain uh, for, their own pe for their own people that they were trying to look after as to why they weren't achieving the results. For instance, some of them walked home with uh, their children and saw what social pressures were enacting. Some of them did housing audits about where their children could work, where they couldn't work, creating a space where children could read. That's the type of holistic new 
uh, social policy that could make the transformative difference. But if you offer that to the middle class as well, then you become the alternate provision that can't be ignored. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I mean, it takes us on to the next question, really, which is a bit more practical. I mean, the French build 120,000 social homes per annum, says Paul Hackett. The UK struggles to build a third of that. What one thing would the panel do to achieve a step change? Nick, do you want to start? Thanks for that, Paul. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I'm going to have two because I'm cheating a little here. Uh, it has to be the case that the current dominance of the big four uh, house builders must be challenged with a range of providers who've got the capacity uh, and the risk appetite to deliver in excess of 10 to 15,000 homes a year. So one of our ambitions at Homes England is to turn the mid-market into a competing Premier League. And I think there are people in this room who can do that by delivering uh, a mix of 10 years into the long term. And the announcement of a 10-year deal yesterday is the, is the chink of light into that future. Uh, and then secondly, uh, we have to open a super factory. Uh, we have to move from producing homes at the moment in pretty much the style they were produced in 1875, never mind 1975, to them turning out of a, of a facility one an hour, every hour, night and day, to the quality of a modern manufactured car. If we could do both of those things, and I think they actually sit together, we could really begin to then have a serious com conversation with communities about what the place is going to be like and the social infrastructure, rather than them often worrying, what's this crap we're going to build be, going to be like? Kate? Okay. Um, I would say land. Land. If we could access land at current use or near current use value, we could do extraordinary things by reinvesting that land value for the benefit of the community into things like affordable housing. If we look back in history, that is how the garden cities were created. The garden city model, which is, is touted for you know, pretty tree-lined streets and people walking along with Labrador, that's great. But what's unique about that model is that is the land. The land was captured at agricultural value, and that value in places like Letchworth Garden City were reinvested for the value of the community. The Heritage Foundation there reinvests three or four million each year into the community for a whole range of projects. A, a third of the housing is still available for social rent, around 31%. It's how the new towns were built. It was disrupting the land market. It was compulsory purchasing land at agricultural or near agricultural value, and using the uplift in land value to fund the building of communities. It wasn't just social housing, it was places. It was places that have good high streets, it was places that had good education, it was places that worked. You might not like the architectural style, of course the car was dominated and all of those things, but the model, the model of the state coming in and helping capture value and then reinvesting it in social good was proven to be really successful and really successful economically. The maths are steely. If you look at the payback from the New Towns programme into government, into Treasury, it is still paying back today. Philip, what one thing to achieve a step change? Well, I agree with the point about land, but I don't think it's decisive in quite the way that many imagine. So it's a canard on the right that the great problem with housing supply is the lack of... Is councils not giving permission and people not giving permission. There's no evidence for that. We, we did research on planning permission and the largest amount of planning permissions that are unfulfilled are in London and the South East. That, and actually planning permissions track building. There isn't a, a gap. But I do completely agree that we need to capture land value. But I repeat my earlier point. The current market is just designed to serve the interests of the top 10 house builders and the market that can afford to buy that. The, when, the, when we built the number of homes we needed, the phenomenon wasn't capturing land value, it was guaranteed buyer. I repeat again, the problem with our housing market is speed and scale. The way we lend money to developers allows their, only allows them to build uh, and then sell that house before they start building and selling another, which is why we can't grow the next 20. 
if uh, housing associations were, uh, came together in partnership with government, which is all online, it's, it's all on our website, and uh, uh, bought out uh, those uh, government who could provide the funds, and actually with land value, you don't even need government, you could raise it privately, we could have housing associations entering the market and say, I don't care about the current provision. I want 50,000 homes this year, and we will buy them, and I want them built this year. That is the single most important thing that would accelerate the market and deliver land supply. Then if you create this new vehicle, and you, and you have land value capture at the front end, which would massively augment the gain, and then you have neutralization at the back end, i.e. what you do with that, that money and that resource, you will essentially generate, over time, Britain's largest pro-social fund. And we did the calculations without land value, and it was roughly 30% return over 10 years. With land value, you could double that. And that would allow you as a sector to become the largest, most successful pro-business sector. And then if you do all the other things that private developers don't do, make homes beautiful, make them beautiful in a, and escape from the type of utilitarianism that pe when people build just purely for profit. And that came home to me when I was up in Cambridge the other day and I stepped out at one of the most important world cities and the appalling buildings around Cambridge uh, Station as testimony to the fact that if you can couple together design and mass building around what people want, you could be the dominant players. And with the type of return you could generate, you could shape not just the housing market, but how people live in exactly the type of garden city environment. And that is also what the middle classes want as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Anne Pam. I'm not going to hold forth on how you produce this massive number. I'm just going to make three points. One, we are hugely land constrained. We're an island, and we've had planning reform upon planning reform in an attempt to free up land, uh, most of which don't seem to be very successful because there is such huge competition for the use of land. That is controlled most of all by environmental impact, and whereas when new towns and garden cities were built, we had a much smaller population and a lot more spare land, so-called. Um, now we're under huge environmental pressures, so flooding, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, climate change itself, and the massive carbon impact and congestion impact on new building. I mean, you know, this is a long thing. So, I would go for infill small sites, which is exactly what the Greater London Council is doing. Islington added more stock um, than any other London borough um, over the last 15 years, precisely because it's only got infill sites. And so it's absolutely majored on small infills, a lot of which have been done by housing associations um, and a lot of which have been done by private developers. You then go to a different kind of scale of builder. You then go to a different kind of scale of linking into communities. You then add incrementally. You use existing infrastructure. You strengthen the schools and all the other things um, that Philip was referring to. And basically, any study that's been done of the capacity of small sites, and when I say small, I mean down to half acres, it's absolutely huge. It's actually uncountable. We only count down to sites of two hectares. And below that, there are literally millions of sites. That's what we should do. Matthew. Uh, very briefly, because we've run out of time. Um, two points. One is, let's, in this conversation, also remember that there are, what, 30 million empty bedrooms in Britain? So part of the housing challenge is also about the fact that we've got to make it easier for people to be in homes, to, be, to right size in their homes. You know, I live in a street in Clapham, and it's just full of four or five bedroom houses which are occupied by two retired people, you know. So that, that's, that is an element of this story, is the better use of the housing that we've got. And I think our tax system and also certain kind of social norms we've got and the way in which we view housing as a financial asset, all of these things get in the way of, 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 of using the housing that we've got more effectively to meet need. I'm not going to add to what other people said. I would just say make a political point. And my, the political point would be this. Uh, I think you need to take the Prime Minister's speech yesterday and just assert that it's a turning point. You know, yes, the policy may not be fully there. Yes, she may have talked a lot about things that are still being consulted on. And 
Yes, she may have to fight on this issue like she's fighting, presume, on the issue of work reform with the Treasury, who have still a, a slightly unreconstructed view of how things uh, operate. Uh, but nevertheless, sometimes in politics, you just have to say a decision's been made now, a, 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 a turning point has come, and we're in a different mode. And I would urge you to just be like that, to say, okay, the Prime Minister said this, it's a new start, the tide has turned, uh, social, you know, uh, housing for social rent is back in fashion, it's going to happen. And then say to, in your dealings with government, local government, national government, say, look, as we've reached this turning point now, as this is what we're doing, these are the things you need to do to deliver on this. So I, I would, it's very easy to be negative, it's very easy to feel the pain of all the years, but I would say just treat yesterday as a turning point and start talking to people about how it is we deliver on you know, an important shift, I think, in rhetoric and aims and commitments over the next few years. That's a very good point on which to end. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, and can I ask you to thank the panel. <laughs>